My name is Mike, I'm an HVAC professional, and we're going to go through the basic logic a service technician uses when they're diagnosing problems on an 80% furnace. By following this procedure, you can often find a lot of simple problems and minor repairs that can really add up to a lot of money. Let's just jump right in. Power, fuel, and a call for heat. Those are the three things that we need to check before we even touch the inside of the furnace. I have to go straight to the thermostat and check I actually have a call for heat. You want to check the settings. You want to make sure there's not a program running in the background. If it's a smart thermostat, you want to make sure there aren't any power issues. And if it's battery operated, you want to make sure the batteries are good. I have been out on service calls for every single one of those things. So let's check that first. We need that call of heat to be constant as we go along the diagnostic process. Once you confirm you have a call for heat, now we have to confirm we actually have 120 volts on the furnace itself. Now, if you have a smart thermostat um, and it's working, that's a good indication that you might have power on the unit. Usually they go blank when the power is off. A lot of homes, they will have a second burner switch, not right by the furnace, but usually it's the top of the stairs leading down to a basement if that's where the furnace is located. Um, I have had some customers who accidentally hit that switch moving boxes up and down the stairs and they didn't realize they turned off their furnace. You also want to check the burner switch down by the furnace itself. And once you get to the furnace, there's usually a peephole inside the furnace doors. You want to take a look in there and see if you can see any lights. Usually there is a light on a control board in there that you can see through these holes. Um, if you still can't see anything, you're going to want to check the breaker, see if that's tripped. And one last thing you can check if you still don't see anything is sometimes if the door is not on securely, um, it won't push in the door switch. Now, every furnace has a door switch that when the door goes on, it pushes that switch in. What that switch does is it cuts off power between the burner switch right on the outside of the furnace and the control board itself. So if that's not pushed in, your furnace isn't going to run. If at this point you still can't confirm power, you don't really see anything, um, at this point you can take the door off and just take a multimeter and there's two wires that go to the door switch you want to test uh, usually it's black wire you want to see if you have power on that if everything else if all the burner switches are on the breakers not tripped you should have power there now you also want to check fuel you want to make sure the gas valve is not off you want to make sure the meter itself isn't shut off for some reason it's very easy to start jumping straight into diagnostics looking for something wrong uh, spend 20 minutes come to a point where you think it might be a gas valve but the real problem is you don't have any fuel so when you check these three things first um, then you're pretty good to proceed into the furnace to start doing some actual diagnostics Now all furnaces have a sequence of operations, certain things that have to happen in a certain order in order for the furnace to actually function. So what we're going to do now is we're going to actually watch this sequence. So the first thing we're going to do, shut the power off on the burner switch. We're going to take the doors off. One of the first things we want to do real quick is just check the fuse that's inside the control board. Um, it's usually a little three or five amp fuse. It looks a lot like that. Um, we're just going to pull it out, hold it up to the light, see if it's burnt out. If it is burnt out, you most likely have a short in the system and that is something you'll have to investigate further. There are videos out there on how to do this. I may make one myself eventually, but we're just gonna stick to the process here. The door switch I was talking about previously, we have to find a way to hold that switch closed with the doors off. A lot of guys use a magnet, they might use tape or some kind of clamp. Once we have the door switch secured closed, what we wanna do is uh, step back, turn the burner switch back on and we wanna see what actually happened. Now do keep in mind, there are often time delays involved in this process especially if you have a smart thermostat it might take a few minutes for the thermostat to actually send out a signal for heat um, if you have a zoning system it's definitely a long time delay it could be about four or five minutes so just be patient but one of the first things that's most likely going to happen is the large blower motor at the bottom of the furnace is going to turn on now this is not actually part of the startup sequence for heat it is a precautionary measure it is a safety feature um, a lot of furnaces they might shut down due to a lack of flame and you don't want all those unburnt gases just kind of sitting there so it turns on the blower motor to clear it all out once the blower motor completes uh, after about a minute or two one of the very first things that should happen is our inducer motor should light up now, this is a little motor it's usually located right on the heat exchanger right near the burners themselves um, and this is the first step in the actual startup sequence if after waiting out time delays you do not see the inducer 
reducer motor coming on, there's one of three possible problems. Either one, we're not actually getting a call for heat. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a multimeter, we're gonna check for power at the R terminal on the control board. We could test this by putting our one lead of our multimeter on the R terminal, the other on either common or a ground lug or even sometimes the metal of the furnace itself, the chassis. Now, if you don't have power on this R terminal, it's usually going to be a high limit switch or a flame rollout switch. These switches are worked into that circuit in the event that the furnace overheats or the flame starts rolling out of it. It cuts that circuit off, cuts off power to that R terminal so that the thermostat cannot continue calling for heat and the furnace shuts down. Now your thermal limit switch that's located usually right on the heat exchanger. You're going to see two wires going to it. You want to do a continuity test. These switches should always be closed. So when you shut the power off, you do a continuity test on both sides of that switch, you should read something. If it's open, um, it's very likely you might have some airflow problems. You want to make sure the blower's running. You want to make sure the supply and return vents are not blocked, dirty filters, things of that nature. Um, dampers in the system could be another possibility. Sometimes you'll have flame rollouts that might be open. Uh, if you have a flame rolling out of a furnace, that could be a sign of a cracked heat exchanger. You end up with unstable flames in those circumstances. If you do have voltage there, you want to test now to see if you have voltage on the W terminal. This is the signal that the control board receives from the thermostat on a call for heat. If you do not have 24 volts on the W terminal, it's very likely there's something going on with the thermostat. Either you don't have a call for heat or the thermostat itself might be bad. In this case, I would shut the power off on the furnace, go up to the thermostat, take the face of the thermostat off, and I would uh, jumper out the thermostat or bypass it. You can do this either by taking alligator clips and going from the R terminal to the W terminal, or if you have two R terminals, such as RH and RC, you want to go from RH to W for H for heating. If you have a smart thermostat, you might not be able to use alligator clips. You might just have to take both of those wires out, the R and W, and just twist them together. Either way, once you have the thermostat jumpered out, Go back down to the furnace, turn the burner switch back on, wait out the time delay, and see if the furnace actually goes all the way through its startup sequence. If it does, you have a bad thermostat. Now, the second possible reason why the inducer may not be starting is because the control board itself is not sending 120 volts out to the inducer motor. In many cases, you can just test from the terminal on the control board that the inducer motor gets power from. And if you don't have any power there, it's very likely you have a bad control board. If we are getting 120 volts at the motor, it's very likely the motor itself can be bad. Now there is one possibility. There could be something stuck inside the squirrel cage behind the blower motor. Um, in which case it's five screws to take it off. Obviously you want to shut the power off before doing this and you want to be very careful when you take it off because there is a gasket behind there that often falls apart when you're taking it off and you don't want to put it back on again without a gasket. This is what keeps the flue gases out of the house. If you do find something jammed up in there, usually just freeing it up and putting it back on again and you're back in business. If there isn't anything in there, it's pretty good chance you have a bad inducer motor. Now the next step in our sequence once the inducer motor is up and running is the pressure switch. This is a switch with a tube connected to it that connects to a chamber on the heat exchanger. When our inducer motor is running it creates a slight pressure differential inside the furnace and that tube connected to the pressure switch can detect that pressure difference. That little pressure difference pulls a diaphragm in the pressure switch and it allows a switch to close. Now your control board is sending 24 volts to this pressure switch and when it closes the 24 volts can then go through the switch and continue on to the rest of the burner circuit. You will know the, the pressure switch is working if you can see the hot surface igniter starting to glow. That means the pressure switch is doing its job because the hot surface igniter is the next step in the startup sequence. But if you don't see the surface igniter lighting up, it's possible the pressure switch could not be making contact. So one of the first things you want to do is you want to take a multimeter. You want to check each one of the two wires going to this pressure switch independently to see if there's 24 volts on both of them. Test one, then test the other. You should have 24 volts on both if it's closed. If it is not closed, if the switch is open, there's a couple of things that could be wrong. One possibility is you might have an obstruction in the flue pipe itself. You can really quickly take the flue pipe off, push it aside, let the furnace start up its sequence again, and keep an eye on the hot surface igniter. If with the flue pipe off, the hot surface igniter starts to glow, go ahead and shut your power off, 
you just found your problem. There's probably obstruction in that flue pipe. If your hot surface igniter still does not light up, then that's unlikely the problem and it's usually something else. Another possibility is the tube coming from the pressure switch to the heat exchanger may actually have something plugged in there. It could be the port, it might have to be reamed out. One thing you do not wanna do, you do not want to blow into or suck on the pressure switch itself. It's very, very fragile. It's very easy to rupture those. So you don't wanna do that. If everything checks out to that point, there's a good possibility the pressure switch itself is bad. Now, the next step in our process is the hot surface igniter should light up. If uh, for whatever reason this hot surface igniter is not lighting up, what you wanna do is there's usually a Molex plug um, that connects to the hot surface igniter. It's two wires, you disconnect it, and you wanna use your multimeter um, and test the Molex plug connection where it goes back to the control board. So you don't even need the hot surface igniter attached for this test. You just wanna make sure you actually do this test at the proper time in the startup sequence. If you do it at any other time, you're not gonna see voltage there. If you do confirm you have 120 volts there and your hot surface igniter is not lighting up, it's likely you had a, a bad hot surface igniter. It could have a crack in it. Um, if you don't see voltage there, what you wanna do is you wanna make sure you have 24 volts going across your pressure switch. Um, you wanna go back and check all your limits, the high limit, the flame rollouts, all those switches I spoke of earlier. If after confirming all that, you still don't have 120 volts there at that particular time in the sequence, you may have a bad control board. If you do have it there and your hot surface igniter is not lighting up, it's usually a bad hot surface igniter. Once your hot surface igniter lights up, after a few seconds, your gas valve should open. If the gas valve is not opening, you wanna test and see if you have 24 volts being sent to the gas valve. If you do have 24 volts there and your gas valve isn't opening, it's probably a bad gas valve. If you don't have 24 volts there, you do wanna go back and test all your limits again, make sure nothing is open. Once your gas valve opens, your first burner should fire up. And what happens is, is these burners, they have these burner jets, they have like wings in them. And the gas, after it lights up the first burner, the gas in the flame travels along these wings to light up each successive uh, port. If there is crud and rust and all kinds of things inside these wings, the gas in the flame will not be able to travel. And so you'll end up with a situation where you only have one port firing up and the others are not. Usually what that means, you have to take these jet ports out and clean them off. If they are clear, all your burners should light up. And at the other end opposite of the hot surface igniter, you will find a flame sensor. Now a flame sensor has one wire going to it and it usually has a hundred volts on this. So it's very important. You don't want to touch these flame sensors with the power on, it will electrocute you. If the flame is making it all the way to the other end, but your furnace keeps shutting down, there's a good possibility that this flame sensor is dirty. Now what a flame sensor does is it takes the 100 volts and when there's a flame there, there's a little bit of voltage that jumps across the flame and touches the metal of the furnace. And this is called flame rectification. If it has carbon buildup on it, the flame rectification will not happen and that's why the furnace is shutting down. So all you need to do is shut the power off, take the one screw out that's holding this flame sensor in place and just use something like a crisp dollar bill or maybe a green dish pad or something just to clean it off. Now you don't wanna use sandpaper or anything else that might leave residue behind because the flame can melt this and actually insulate whatever that residue is. So if you use sandpaper, it can actually melt that residue into a glass and insulate the flame sensor, which will cause even more problems. Now, once your furnace fully lights up and the furnace detects flame rectification, the final step in the process is that your blower motor will come on. Now, I just went out on a call the other day where the whole process went through. The blower motor came on, but the furnace quickly shut down after a minute. And one thing about these blower motors is that if you have 120 volts going to them, they will run. But if they have a capacitor on them and that capacitor is bad, they will not run at full speed. So when a blower motor comes on, it should be powerful. It shouldn't just be spinning. If that's what you see, you want to test the capacitor, make sure that's good. It's usually a 10 microfarad capacitor and there are videos out there on how to test them. 
And so that's the process for the most part. And it can help you find dozens of problems with a furnace before you actually have to call in the big guns. Now, if after all this, you still can't find a problem, usually at this point, it takes a little bit of experience to weed out what the issue may be, and it's time to call somebody in. But hopefully with what we went over today, most problems can be resolved just by using this process.